Hey everyone, in this video I want to explore the various protections available for workload identities. These very important identities, for example service principles, that often have very heightened sets of permissions to interact with other resources, talk to other service layers. So what can I do to really lock down and put protections around them? As always, this video is useful. Please go ahead and like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new content. Now, if I think about just regular Azure Active Directory, so we as an organization have our own Azure AD tenant. So we have a particular instance. So I have my Azure AD. And when I think of Azure Active Directory normally in the types of objects, first and foremost, we think about, well, there's users. We have users in our Azure Active Directory. And when I think about protecting users, there's lots of things available to us. I think, hey, multi-factor authentication. I think passwordless. I use things like conditional access and I can do different considerations and controls. I can make them do MFA. I can make them change their password. I can maybe lock it down to a restricted set of permissions based on factors. It could be risk, the risk of an individual sign-in, the overall risk of a user. So there's lots of things I can do. There are devices. But what about these workload identities? But I guess first, what are we talking about? So when I talk about a workload identity, what exactly is that? And I think this is one of those definitions that may vary a little bit. But when I'm talking about it, I'm thinking about, for example, an application registration. So if I'm creating a line of business application for my organization, I create an app registration into my Azure Active Directory. So we actually get this app registration object. And that is globally unique. If I was to create my application as multi-tenant, then there's still only one application registration that exists. This is that globally unique representation of my application, and it actually serves as a template for when a instance of that application is lit up in other Azure AD tenants, or even my Azure AD tenant. Because the next type of workload identity I'm gonna think about is actually a service principle. Now a service principle, this is the local Azure AD representation of an application. Even if it is a line of business application that only exists in my Azure AD tenant, well I'm still gonna have a service principle that is the representation of the application. I have a whole video that goes into details about app registrations and service principles and enterprise applications. And it's the service principle that can have things like a secret and or certificate that could then be used to actually authenticate as that service principle and then take advantage of whatever permissions it might have to other types of resources. So that service principle is that local instantiation of that globally unique app registration. If it was a multi-tenant app and that app registration was in a different Azure AD tenant, I would have a service principle in my tenant that was the local instance of the template application defined. It would point back to the app registration in a different tenant. So we have the service principle. Now also, we have a managed identity. Now a managed identity is just a special kind of service principle. And remember when we talk about an app registration, the object we're really focusing on here is the service principle. The service principle kind of relates to an app registration. But the big deal about a managed identity is that its life cycle is either linked to a particular Azure resource if it's a system assigned, 
or it has its own life cycle, but I have to say which resources can act as that managed identity, a user assigned managed identity. And the fantastic thing about managed identity is, is there is no secret or cert I have to store somewhere because it's just inherent to as the resource, I can request a token as that identity. So I don't have to worry about storing a secret or storing a certificate somewhere to be able to do that actual authentication. So this is what we're talking about when we say workload identities. But the key part is for all of these, it's really this service principle. That's really what it boils down to. I'm authenticating as a service principle. The service principle has authorizations to other types of resource. And what I want to think about is sure, okay, we have this service principle. And if I want to use it, I could think about, well, I have some application somewhere. So I could think, okay, I've written my application. And remember, my application needs to authenticate to Azure AD. So it needs to get that service principle. So maybe, and this is not what we want to do, maybe there's a file somewhere. There's a file with the identity and some secret, or it's part of the certificate that I have to read in as my application to get the detail about the service principle. And then I go to Azure AD to actually perform my authentication, my authorization, I get my token that I can then use for other things. Maybe I'm accessing resources as myself, as the service principle. Maybe I'm doing an on behalf of, I'm getting a consent from the user to do something on behalf of them to resources they own. But hey, look, I have to be able to authenticate as this. So realize an application, I can't do MFA. I can't do a nice strong authentication like I can with a user. Um, I have to store that credential somewhere. That's why managed identities are so good because I don't have to store that credential anywhere. It's just inherent to the resource. It can only be used by that particular resource or set of resources if it's a user assigned. If I store it in something like a key vault, well, how do I authenticate to the key vault to be able to unlock the secret? I get a chicken and egg problem. And additionally, it's very uncommon for the application to actually go and change its own secret. So there's a whole life cycle challenge I have with these things. So ultimately I end up with what is generally a high privileged identity that is kind of open to risk of abuse. So I want to be able to lock that down. I want to detect when there are these anomalous types of behavior, when something out of the ordinary. So how do I actually go and detect and do things around this? If I think about a regular user identity, we have the Azure AD identity protection that actually goes and looks for various types of signals. So it finds detections of risk. Some of those might be live online detections that I can use as part of an individual sign-in risk tolerance. Some of them filter up and will filter up to the overall user's risk. So I can get reports of, hey, risky things that are happening, and we can go and look at this. So if I was to jump over from my Azure AD portal, and I go and look at identity protection, we have these whole sets of risk detections to see, hey, risky things about users. Those would then bubble up if they were um, signals that could be used for sign-in to risky sign-ins. I could see those that would then bubble up to overall risky users based on both online and offline detections. That's great for the user, but what about for these workplace identities? Well, notice if I go to risk detections, there's actually now this workload identity detection. And I can go and select that and I've actually got one. Likewise, we also see, hey, risky workload identities are now available as well. Now notice we don't have a risky workload identity sign-in. That's not part of where we are today. This is really based about, hey, risk detections for workload identities, and then a risky overall workload identity. Users tend to authenticate a lot less frequently than a service principle, so there are some differences. So today the focus is really about, hey, risk detections on workload identities, 
and then the risk overall um, perception of a particular workload identity. So there's a whole separate set of identities and signals that we look for for those workplace identities. And they are called out in the documentation. So if we jump over here in the documentation, it walks through the actual types of detections it's doing. So there's various types of, hey, Azure AD threat intelligence. So coming from the Microsoft's internal, external threat intelligence sources, suspicious sign-ins based on, it's gonna learn behaviors. So that whole machine learning, and it's talking about, look, it's gonna look for a period of days on what is normal. And then once it's worked out what's normal, it can look at all the different factors around a particular use of the identity. IP address, ASN, uh, the target resource, the user agent, uh, the IP change, IP country credential type. So it's gonna go and look at those things to start detecting. This is kind of a suspicious use of this principle. Then the use of credentials, for example, um, for an OAuth app, I can as an administrator confirm, hey, an account is compromised and leaked credentials. Hey, look, we're actually finding a credential, for example, on GitHub, um, on the dark web, pasted on a site. So it's gonna go and look for leaked credentials. And this is the one I'm actually gonna demo just for a bit of fun with this. Now notice all of these are offline. So this is that key part that, that's why there isn't a workload identity sign-in risk as such, because those use the online signals when I combine this with something like conditional access policies. So these are all offline but I can see that these various different signals available to me. Now, another key part of where this technology is today is there are different types of applications. There's single tenant. So for a single tenant, I would think about a line of business application. It's saying I'm writing, I create the app registration for it, and then it's just used in my tenant. It could be a third party app, but I'm still deploying an application instance into my tenant. So this is what we're focusing on when I think about the protection that we're seeing today with this new identity protection based capability. It's when I have that app registration. So I'm thinking about a line of business application. That's what this is focused on. If it's an app from another tenant and it's just an enterprise app, this is not gonna work with that today. So it's focused around those line of business applications. Now, what I can do is then, there's different types of protection based on those signals we see. And I guess I should just quickly show the difference between those applications. So if I was to go to my Azure AD, and I was gonna do an app registration, what we're looking for is this. It's accounts in this organizational directory only. It's single tenant. It is not one of these multi-tenant offerings. So it's this first type of app registration where it's just my tenant, where this protection is actually going to apply to. So that's the focus for this. And now let's think about, well, okay, those, those protections. So after I register an application, I'm gonna demo the leaked credential one. So as part of an application, so I look at my, I create a leaked app. <laughs> You can define certificates and secrets. So I defined a oops secret. So it has a certain value that it showed me when I created it. There's a particular ID because I could have multiple secrets. And then of course I have the app itself. The app has an ID and my Azure AD has a, a tenant ID. So I can see these various values. I can see, hey look, yeah, I've got an application ID. I've got a tenant ID. So if I know those things, and I know the secret value, well, I could use that to authenticate as that service principle. So what I'm gonna do is something really stupid. Now, if you were gonna try this out, to protect yourself, after you go and create this app registration, make sure you actually go to the application itself. And what you need to make sure you do is in properties, make sure you disable it for users to sign in. Otherwise, when you go and publish this to the public repo, well, people will actually use it. So make sure you disable it for sign-in. So then what I did is I did something really silly. 
I went and pasted those attributes, the secret value, the app ID, and the tenant ID to a GitHub repo. Well, rather than just try and find the repo, if I look at my risk detections, well, it has a, re a detection. And it's showing, hey, look, leaked app has leaked credentials. Okay, so I could select that, and it's giving me the detail. It's a high risk because obviously, hey, look, <laughs> I've got the credential for this. It was offline. It was for service principal. It shows me when it was detected. It shows me the app ID and the key ID and the service principal. So that key ID, notice it starts with 5AC. So if I was to jump back over and actually look at my app registration, I'll go and look at my leaked apps. Remember, 5AC was the start. Well, I can see, oh, okay, if I had multiple secrets, I know which one. It's giving me the ID that it's found. So I'd know which secret I need to actually go and rotate, create a new value for. Additionally, if I click additional info, it's actually taking me to where it found the credential. So I very stupidly created a file and it was in a public repo where I had the Azure AD client ID, the actual secret value, and the tenant ID. So it's showing me this is where it got leaked. So if you had some developer that accidentally put this into a configuration file and then checked it in, which by the way is super common, it's actually showing me exactly where. So I could go and talk to the developer, get it corrected. But again, it's telling me exactly which secret. So I would go and invalidate that one and go and create a new one. And then there are various other activities I can do around there. But because it was a risk detection linked to that service principle, well now if I look at my risky workloads, the risk level on the identity is high. So now I can go and look at the identity itself. I can see the risk history of what's led to this state. And I could go and do things like, well, hey, I can confirm it was compromised. I could dismiss it. I could go and enable the service principles. There's different actions I can take. But the whole point is this is just one of those signals that it's looking for. Remember, there was the other ones about suspicious types of activity. All of those things I showed will go into this. I'm just showing one of them. But at this point, I can now detect and find, hey, look, uh, something bad has happened here. You've got this risk available to me. So I can go and see it from within here directly. But also, just in my regular Azure Active Directory, let's say I had an external system. If I go to my diagnostic settings, well, as part of my diagnostic settings, I can send those to some other system. Hey, my risky service principles, my service principle risk events. I could send them via Event Hub to a SIM. I could put them in a storage account. I could send to Log Analytics. All the regular things I can do with my diagnostic settings are available to me here as well. And so the key point now is if I find this, if I have that risk detection, I would go and act on that. I would go and rotate that secret, change the certificate, disable it, uh, maybe go and create a completely new one, whatever I have to do. Now you're careful how you do this. If it was a production app, I don't want to just rotate it and the app falls over. There would be maybe a certain process involved, but I would go and act on that. I could create alerts around these things. So this is a, a key part about raising awareness of where that is actually happening. Then there's another level to that. And that's the idea of great, the identity protection feature is making me aware, but now I want to actually lock this down. And if I think about how do I lock things down in Azure Active Directory? How do I automatically enforce certain controls? Well, we use conditional access. And there's now a separate conditional access. When I select, hey, what am I looking at? Instead of being users and groups, I can pick workload identities. Now, I'll show you this. Now, for a normal user, there's a whole bunch of controls I can do. 
make them do an MFA, make them be hybrid joined, make the device be healthy, um, have these restricted sets of options or block them. Well, for workload identity, I can't make any of that behavior happen. The only thing I can do is block. So my control will be, if I'm gonna match the conditions that I specify, I'll block it. And when I think about what those conditions are, I can base them today on location. And remember, locations could be maybe based on country. It could be based on the public IP that Azure AD sees as part of the authentication. Maybe in the future, we might even see integrations with, hey, it's coming from a certain virtual network through private link, who knows? But that might be usable there as well. And based on the workload identity risk. So it's and or those things. Now remember though, my control is to block. So when I think about how I would construct the policy, I can't specify the locations I want to allow. Instead, I would say all locations except the ones that are safe. So then all of the locations get blocked except for the ones I actually go and exclude. So that's the key part of what I can actually do. Remember, conditional access is this wall that always applies. There is no bypassing conditional access. It's always gonna take that effect. And so let's see this. So if I jump over, if I now go to my security and I'll go conditional access, well, actually before I do conditional access, we can actually go and see named locations. So remember today, I could create a location based on country, which could be based on the IP address blocks for that country or GPS coordinates. That's generally more of a, a mobile device scenario or I can actually specify the public IP that will be seen by Azure AD, maybe my NAT gateway, whatever that might be. So those are what I have available to me today. So I can define named locations. And then in my policy, I select the users or workload identities. So what I'm gonna do here, instead of users and groups, I'm gonna go and select workload identities. And I'm gonna do all owned service principles. So all owned, what does that mean? That means all of the single tenant apps in my Azure AD. So I wanna apply this to every service principle that is a line of business app. So we've done that. I'm gonna target everything, all cloud apps. And then my conditions, I have two. So we have locations. So if I wanted to use locations, remember the way I would use this is I would say, well, it's any location I'm gonna include except for the ones that I know are good. So then this control will apply to every location except this named location. So I would configure the policy that way. Likewise, I could and or use risk. So I might say, well, if the risk is high, then uh, yeah, I'm, this, is, this control will apply. And then my control is block. That's the only control I have available. I can't look at device health, I can't require an MFA, I can't require a password change, none of the things make sense for a service principle. But I can block the access. Finally, obviously, I would change the enable policy to on. Now potentially before you change that to on, I might wanna go and learn, well, what is the impact of this actually going to be? So I could use the report only mode, so I would see what would happen without actually having any impact on it. And that's how I can now use it. So I can base my workload identity use on a location and or using that risk that it can now see. So I have these great capabilities for my workload identities available. Now, what would the experience be of that application? So if it gets blocked, the app will basically return a message that this was blocked by conditional access. So the application now, you'd have to write the code to interpret that, but you will get told this was blocked by conditional access. If I looked at the sign-in logs, for the Azure AD, um, the service principal signings will show the detail of exactly what happened there. And this is it. 
Now this is in preview at the time of recording, so I don't know what the actual licensing will be. To try it out today, I just need my Azure AD tenant to be an Azure AD Premium P2 level. So that means I just have to have at least one user has an Azure AD P2 license. Now, once it actually releases, I suspect, but I don't know, there'll be some kind of maybe per workload identity or something else to be licensed to leverage this functionality. But you can go and try this out now in preview. You just need one Azure AD Premium P2 license. And you pick what you're interested in. So maybe initially you just want that kind of reporting and knowledge of it. So you'd see that in the Azure AD identity protection. I can see the risk events and I can see the risky workload identities. And then I can build on that by now using conditional access to maybe block if that risk is medium or medium and high to help give me that protection. Those signals, I think, will build up over time. And you, I'm showing you the preview one where it's actually finding a leaked credential. If you're going to try that out, make sure you don't actually really expose, make sure it is disabled and it doesn't have permissions to anything you really care about. Um, and yeah, I can also use locations. If I know it's coming from a certain um, location, and I could lock it down to only coming from that location. So there's some great things I can do around the control as well. So I think, hey, detection, and then actually the control. So that was it. As always, I hope this was useful. I think this is a, a really great capability when I think about the power that these workload identities will typically have. They do tend to have those heightened permissions. So this is a, a great step to give me more visibility and protection um, from them being abused. So until next video, take care.